When sudden tragedy finds us isolated from the life-saving care we need, we are reminded of both the frailties and the strengths which human beings possess. I'm William Shatner. Tonight, true stories of heroes who inspire us to reach out to others on Rescue 911. We begin on January 12, 1990, during the height of ski season at the popular Copper Mountain Resort in Colorado. People are on vacation, they're trying to pack as much fun as they can possibly pack into five days, three days, one week, whatever. And they're going to bolt right to the mountains. And they're not going to think about taking care of themselves or adjusting to altitude. And they get caught. Richard Coberly and his friend had driven all night so they could be on the slopes first thing in the morning. Need to be able to grab some air somewhere. Richard let his less experienced friend, 47-year-old Sam Allen, set the pace. He hadn't skied in a year, and this was his first day on the slopes. Spray me again, you're dead. <laughs> on that run, he took a couple of tumbles and got winded a little bit, which wasn't all that unusual a thing to have happen on a first day skier from a lower altitude who's been up all night. Oh, man. Get tired. Your legs bug me. Oh, yeah. Although Sam was breathing hard, he got in line with Richard for another run. They were paired up for the 12-minute chairlift ride with Carl Reddick and his brother. We overhear one person asking his friend if he's feeling all right. And he responds, yeah, he's feeling fine. So we go ahead and get on the chair and start on the way up. this chair before myself ron and richard are talking talking about skiing and that and so get about halfway maybe a little bit farther than halfway up richard turns and asks sam again if he's feeling all right sam began to fidget and expressed problems with his breathing and became uh, slightly disoriented uh, i felt like something was definitely wrong i wasn't sure exactly what something's not right he seemed to be getting progressively worse. Both Carl and Ron Reddick had had some training in emergency medicine. We thought the altitude was definitely getting to him, and we tried to calm him down. You know, just, you know, you're going to be all right, Sam. You know, just take it easy, take deep breaths. And that didn't work. Yeah, I think so he just needs to take it a little easy up the top there yeah. and uh, catch his breath. Uh, What's going on? Oh, man. Oh, yeah. Out of the chair. I'm trying to reach across behind the back of him. I could just barely get out of the, you know, Sam's uh, carotid artery and, you know, didn't feel anything. Can you reach his neck? I didn't say anything Any about me thinking that he was having a heart attack because I didn't want to worry Richard and have Richard let him go. I can barely hold him in here. My biggest concern was how far we were from the top of the mountain. I, I thought he could, he could get out of it if we could just get help to him stop the lift on top his skis won't clear they tried to get the don't attention of the people in front of them so the lift car. operator could be warned did you hear what he said from the chair behind ski patroller andy brown happened to hear their cries for help what's the problem the distance between the chairs is sufficient i couldn't really communicate with them that well i radiated to the patrol headquarters so that uh, we could get some assistance to the top of the chair and At the summit headquarters, ski patrol members got Andy's call for help okay. and thought it was just another case of altitude sickness. Sam's skis were hanging down, and if he would have come up against that ridge that they've got at the top of the chairlift, it would have just snapped his back. Get the bar up, guys. Get the bar up. 
More than four minutes had passed since Sam's collapse before they were finally able to get him off the chairlift and start treating him. Move the chair ahead. The Reddick brothers immediately began doing CPR. All right, some help for Yeah, I'll go get on the floor. The ski patrol behind us yelled at us. And I guess when he saw that we started CPR, he called in that there was a cardiac arrest up at the top of the lift. Paramedic Kevin Kelbel also happened to be on ski patrol that day. I was on the other side of the mountain when the call came in and requested that the code 2 pack, which is all of our advanced cardiac life support equipment, be ready for me to take over there. We've had cardiac arrests that have either happened on the chair or happened right after getting off the chair. And unfortunately, these people were never successfully resuscitated. One, two, three, four, five. When we continue, I really had resigned myself to the fact that he was dead, that there was not going to be any coming back for him. Okay. It had been more than five minutes since 47-year-old Sam Allen had suffered a heart attack on a ski lift. From the chair behind him, ski patroller Andy Brown had radioed for help, but they were 11,000 feet up the mountain without the medical equipment needed to save the victim's life. One, two, three, four, five. Lee Kirsch and the ski patrol arrived on the scene and started with CPR. And I had the lift operator move the chair forward so that I could help Lee. His eyes were open, but unresponsive. He's very gray, pale, ashen look. I mean, it's a it's a look of death. Clear the chest, please. Clear it. Fire. He's only been down for 10 minutes. Okay, he's flatlined. CPR, please. CPR. He's not showing it on the monitor right now, but he's still a patient that there's a chance. And as long as there's a chance, we're going to work it. Dr. Mark Hallett had been monitoring the radio calls from the medical clinic at the base of the mountain. The call came that they wanted Dr. Armour or myself uh, up there because uh, things didn't look good. It's amazing how it tears at you because this is a person you've only known 20 minutes. You know, and to have that kind of feelings, you know, knowing that, you know, he might not make it. It's rough. I, I think I got there about... Uh, 20 to 25 minutes after he had first had his arrest. His heart uh, did all kinds of things, you know, from fast rhythms to slow rhythms to no rhythms. Uh, some of those rhythms he had a blood pressure, other rhythms he didn't. Although we couldn't get a good blood pressure in his arm, he had strong pulses in his neck. So I made the decision that we better try and get him down the mountain. Nice pulses. Guys, yeah, still got a good femoral. We're looking good. Okay. okay. Are we ready to move here, guys? They knew the trip would take more than 10 minutes. He did have a, a pulse and his heart was beating fine, but he still was not breathing on his own. We need to now get to definitive care. But if I make the move and make the commitment to the toboggan, I'm making a commitment to a patient that I can no longer do advanced life support on. With Sam in one toboggan and another toboggan strapped to it to carry the emergency workers, they began the 2,500-foot descent to the mountain's medical clinic. I skied down beside the sled. I felt like if he ever did regain consciousness, if there was a familiar voice there, that it might be of some benefit. I don't know if that was correct or not, but I had nowhere else to go. I need the O. You're going over bumps and moguls. The snow's coming in your face. You're trying to monitor your patient. Unfortunately, electrically, the monitor picks up that same vibration, so it's hard to see his rhythm and pulses. Okay, get ready to whip it! Look at your car. Okay. Bag it easy. Here we go. Work him up. I started seeing him starting to move his arms, and Donnie noticed it also. And Donnie actually said, you know, I'm starting to get occasionally a spontaneous breath. 
At this stage, he probably regained enough of his subconscious to get his gag reflex back, which is unfortunate for us because we have a tube down his throat. Even though our patient was never conscious, we're in an arm wrestling battle. He goes right out over the knee. Okay, I got him. Strap him. Keep him down. He slowly started slowing down on us. Yeah, he's definitely flat. Hit it hard, We lost him. We lost him. He's flat. We had lost him. He was back into VTAC, and we didn't have pulses anymore. I really had resigned myself to the fact that he was dead, that there was not going to be any coming back for him. I can't find I just couldn't believe how much effort and care they were putting into it because in my uneducated opinion, I just couldn't imagine how they were going to get him back. From the time that he had his arrest to the time we got to the clinic was about 40 minutes. Three, four, Everyone clear? Five. And fire. You just never know when the person you're trying to save is going to be one of that 10% who make it. So you just have to push as hard as you can until it becomes unreasonable to go on. Fire. Okay, What's it? Got? Give it time. Right, give it time. Are we getting anything? I'm well, we seeing got, something. We got an air complex. We got, got pulses of that? We got a pulse, pulse here. Oh, I see ETA on flights. On the way. They're they're going going on. 20 minutes now. 25 minutes. A Flight for Life helicopter arrived to transport Sam to a hospital in Denver. Nurse Lori Aston headed up the medical team on board. I really thought we would be canceled on the way up. Anybody that arrested on a chairlift and to go through the time span of getting off the chair down the mountain to the clinic, it, it just didn't sound like a very good uh, prognosis. In the tracks on this side. Okay, watch my tubes. Got your tubes. Got your tubes. More than an hour and a half after Sam Allen suffered a heart attack, the chopper took off to St. Anthony's Medical Center. Dr. John Farrell was on call that day. My initial role was to try to stabilize his rhythm and blood pressure and give his brain a chance to recover. And then I called Mrs. Allen to let her know what was going on. I told her that he was in critical condition, and I did not know whether he would survive or not, and I also did not know... Uh, whether his brain function uh, would return to normal or not. Carolyn Allen flew to Denver, not knowing if her husband would still be living when she arrived. Um, you're not going to be able to talk to him. When I first saw him, my first thought was, I'm just so glad that you're alive. I told him I was here. I didn't know whether he could hear or not. I really didn't care. I was just going to let him know that I was there. Sam underwent surgery to remove a blockage in his right coronary artery. Two weeks later, he was released from the hospital with no sign of brain damage. By the next ski season, Sam Allen was back on the slopes. This time, his wife Carolyn joined him. I'll catch up with you. I think my life has not changed so much that I become paranoid about things that I shouldn't do. I feel really just as healthy as I did before this happened. He is a fighter. He's the kind of person who knows pretty much what he wants to do and tries to go out and do it. But the real hero is the ski patrol because they did their job. They did it flawlessly and they did it quickly and successfully. I wish I could review it. How the hell are you? Andy Brown. That's right. Kevin, how are you, Sam? I am very much amazed that he walked out of the hospital. I owe a lot of things to a lot of people. Good to see you. Good to see you. Looking good. What saved this guy, in my mind, was the guys that were doing CPR before we got there with all the fancy equipment. A year ago, January the 12th. The date, I know. <laughs> There's one thing he can remember. I just want to know if he's mellowed out any since... <laughs> Everybody had a part in this. And what was such a miracle is that everything was placed in such a timely manner. I thank God for putting all of this cohesiveness of the ski patrol, all the people, they were all there when they needed to be there. The teamwork is incredible. 
and they're just great people. They're super people.